determined ideas about what open means. Right? One of the things in the field of open education or in the field of open educational resources that happens a lot is you start to think of open education is a predetermined repository like Merlot, which it is. Merlot is a repository of great resources. One of the problems Merlot ran into again and again is that it took too long for them to vet and to put stuff up. So over the course of you would you know, submit something to Merlot and two years later maybe it would make its way out onto line. Well, with the social networks and social media we have, someone submits something and possibly within a day or two, people are betting whether it's a good resource. And if you have a network set up that you, of people you trust in your field, they will help you understand and determine what's a useful resource and what isn't. That's kind of the power of the social network, right? A lot of people for years and years have said to me, and I've been on Twitter since like 2007, right? They say to me, that is the stupidest thing in the world. Twitter, you're wasting your time, you pretend to be a professional, and you do your 140 characters all day, da 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 da, you're annoying, get away from me, right? I've heard this. <laughs> One of the things I learned about Twitter, and I agree with all of that. I'm not going to discount it. One of the things I learned about Twitter over time, and there's an example from my own teaching that has really kind of hit home, is that Twitter helped me devise and create a network of people who I trust, who constantly feed back into my teaching, into my learning, and into my students' teaching and learning. And if I hadn't spent that time that so many people thought I was wasting, for years in cultivating a network of people to work with, I would have never had the possibilities I find I have with teaching and learning right now. And rather than being vague, let me get to some specifics that I'm talking about. Um, particularly with how this idea of open resources, outside the model of open educational resources, because you guys are doing a fine job there. You're creating textbooks, you're making them available, you're saving students potentially millions of dollars in the aggregate. But there's all these resources right now, whether it be Weebly for creating quick and easy websites, right? Or whether it be NPR for sharing media. I mean, you guys are using these resources. So let's talk a little bit about what this idea of open is and how we might think of these resources in relationship to a notion that I think is extremely important for the teacher, the professor, and the student in the 21st century, and that's this idea of networking. What does it mean to network? in the 21st century, particularly around teaching and learning. All right, so let me get into the presentation mode a little bit. But here's the deal with the presentation, <coughs> to be clear. Every slide, and you can follow this from the front page of my site, the, the Adopting Open, you just go to that presentation tab, and you can actually open up the presentation, full screen it, and follow along. There are also links under every slide that is relevant to find a site. Feel free to explore those sites I talk about. Does that make sense? And we'll actually pause at several points throughout the presentation to talk about some of this stuff. All right. Okay. So, adopting open. What does it mean? What am I talking about? Well, let's get in here. I want to go a very brief history of tech at universities, and particularly higher ed, right? colleges and universities, because as we were talking about earlier, University of Mary Washington is a small liberal arts college, right? For some reason, they tried to call us a university, but we're not a university. We're a small liberal arts college. Our professors do not have the same focus on research as they do on teaching. We're a teaching college. We teach 4-4, right? Our professors are invested in teaching. They're invested in small, kind of intimate classroom settings where we're intimate around the idea of teaching and sharing. That's what we do. That's not our definition of a university, but in this day and age, everyone wants to be called a university just to be called a university. Right? That distinction is kind of lost, and I think it's problematic. So, <laughs> point here. Kind of the, the industry of IT, our notion of IT kind of started around this idea of email, right? We all have university emails. My first email was jgroom at ucla.edu. First one, it was 1994. It was the craziest thing, because that's my, my first turn on to the internet in general. And I think 1996, when I left UCLA, I never used that email again. It was lost to me, right? 
they said, you know what, here's your little email. No. And they pulled it away. And I lost all my emails. And I didn't, I wasn't smart enough to archive. So all that is gone. Or at least it's on some, like, you know, storage at UCLA's campus I don't know about. And they're going to use it later on when I kind of go on investigation. But we'll deal with that later. <laughs> so there was this idea of email. The idea of email is you use it while you're there. But when you leave, we take it away from you. And there's this kind of strange notion of, you know, we're spending all this money on an infrastructure around email, but it's ultimately something that won't even allow us to keep in connection with our alumni. There are some universities that do that, but not many. But in many ways, now, this is in some ways an identifier. This is a domain. This is something that identifies me, jgroom at umw.edu. All of you have this, at least relationship to your institutions, right? And when you leave that institution, is chances are you lose part of that identity. Well, there's also this. Anyone familiar with this? The dreaded shared drive. Right? We all know this. This is part of our technical evolution as well. I have a file. I'm going to copy it over here. And what happens is there's 5 million files, just like the one I copied, and no one can tell which is which. And it's just a big... Junk drawer. Chaotic junk drawer. I mean, that is exactly what the shared file, right? But you know what? I should knock this. Ten years ago, this was radical. It was radical that we could even do it. And there were some really important uses for it. But when you start having something like Google Apps, and you're able to share those files so easy, I mean, it raises some questions. Or Dropbox. How many of you use Dropbox? I mean, Dropbox is amazing as a tool to share files like this. So once again, the institution is being outpaced by the practice. And then, I'm sorry, and this person is actually from Washington. Is this anyone here? <laughs> Do you know this person? Because I just found it on the web. It might be unethical for me to use it, so I thought it was here in this room. I didn't even think it's a Walla Walla Washington. Could be closer. Well, you know, Marvin Denny has nothing to hide, right? This is a perfectly fine homepage. But this is a home page that he probably had to program in HTML, then upgrade or upload through whether it be front page or Dreamweaver through FTP to create this web page. How often do you think Marvin L. Denny updates this? Maybe every third, fourth year, right? I mean, it's very hard, right? Yeah, the grandbaby is now 16 years old, just so you know. <laughs> I mean, the idea here is that this is a personal site that 10 years ago, if I were to ask everyone in this room to create this, it would take a full day workshop. I'd have to give you instructions, give you, and then you'd have to come home and maybe you'd do it once to create your site and you'd never do it again. People pointed in those resources to something like Weebly, WordPress.com, Google Sites, Etc. Etc. You can do this drag and drop, complete, simple web page, personalized web page, without doing any <coughs> code at all. That's been the transformation of the web in the last ten years. Is making it simple for you to frame an experience online, to share information online, without all of us having to be a computer science major. That's a radical transformation. The idea of making the web easy to program. It's why they call it the programmable web. Because we now, as civilians in the web, we don't have to be in the ditches creating the code. We now can program the web. And it changes our relationship to it. So even something like a personal homepage like this, even though they're still used, more and more they're going to be outdated if not gone. Right? And you remember this? Tilda J. Groom. I would show you mine, but mine's gone now. I don't have it. Right? So this was kind of the URL to get there. And a lot of people associated their digital identity with their university, right? Particularly because that was one of the few places that would offer them the space to do it. They would offer them service space. They would offer them an email. They would offer them storage. Now who's offering us that? Google. Now there's questions there. I don't want to pretend like, oh, Google's great. It will save us, particularly because I'm in the home of Microsoft. <laughs> you got to be careful. Uh, but then we have this. Dun, 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 dun. The MS. What I like to call the black 